it looks like it's one o'clock in California. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name, or sorry, yes, let's get started for our virtual field trip to our final one in our series. And we're gonna visit the Sky Island region in Arizona. So welcome, we're so glad that you're here. My name is Allison Murdoch Haslam and I'm a Legacy Club Stewardship Manager. I'm based in Southern California and I've been with TNC for about eight and a half years. I'm interested to see where you're joining us from today. So Elaine will go ahead and share those poll results. All right, it looks like, I can't believe it. We have over 300 people joining us today, which is so great. And it looks like the majority are in the West. Welcome to everybody. And it looks like a lot of people have been to Southeastern Arizona before, so that's great. Welcome, we're excited. I think whether or not you've been there before, I think we're all gonna learn a lot today. I wanna send a special warm welcome to our Legacy Club members and Conservancy friends for joining us. The forward-thinking commitment of our Legacy Club members makes the work we're talking about today possible. So thank you for your support. Before we get started on our journey, you'll see um, a couple of details on your screen that go over closed captioning and where to type your questions in for our speakers. Please be sure to type in any questions you'd like answered into the Q&A box directly. We will be showing a video during our tour today. Please note that the quality of the video you see on your screen will depend on your internet speed. But we'll be recording today's presentation and sending out the link to the presentation and the video after so you'll be able to watch it in the future. I'm now pleased to introduce you to our Arizona State Director who will kick off our virtual field trip. Dan, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Allison, and welcome everyone. Dan Steller, Arizona State Director. Today's tour will take you to the lands of Southeastern Arizona. It was great to see that so many of you have visited Southeastern Arizona, and you may know that several of the rivers in that part of the state actually originate in Mexico and they flow north creating natural corridors which generations of native people traveled through. Many tribes today consider it to be part of their ancestral homeland including the Tohono O'odham, the Hopi, Zuni, and San Carlos Apache tribes. Today we will be sharing the immense biodiversity that the Sky Island region offers as a natural migratory pathway for wildlife of all types. The Conservancy has worked in this area for over 50 years, conserving important places like the Mule Shoe Ranch and Aravipa Canyon. And we really thank you, our Legacy Club participants, for your generous contributions to this work and for your support throughout the years. TNC simply would not be able to preserve such amazing places throughout the world without your support. I've been state director in Arizona for about six months, and one of the most humbling parts of my role is being fortunate enough to have and get to know partners such as you all. Your commitment to TNC is really inspiring. And in fact, I became a Legacy Club member myself after being inspired by the generosity and forward-thinking commitments of our friends such as you all. So with that, thank you again for being part of today's presentation and for your support for our work here at the Nature Conservancy. We're going to get started with a view of the San Pedro River and our mule shoe and our viper preserves. I hope you enjoy the view. Our Sky Island adventure is set in the desert lands of southeastern Arizona. This is an arid landscape but it is not a lifeless wasteland. This is a land of surprises, where tall mountains protrude from the desert floor, creating cool microclimates, where iconic saguaros of the Sonoran Desert meet the yuccas of the Chihuahuan Desert, where the Rocky Mountains meet the Sierra Madre Highlands of Mexico. This is a convergence. Here you'll find birds, animals, and plants found nowhere else in the world. It's set in one of the largest unfragmented landscapes in Arizona. Running through the heart of this landscape is the San Pedro River. So here we've got plants and animals from the Rocky Mountain ecoregion reaching their southern tip. 
from the south extending northward are animals and plants that are native only to the Madrean ecosystem, the Sierra Madres of Mexico. And then on either side, we have the, the huge uh, Chihuahuan Desert and the, and the, and the large uh, Sonoran Desert overlapping and coming together right here. So four ecoregions, all of them contributing their own unique flora and fauna to this part of Arizona. And you put it together and add a river flowing through it and you get something that's just beyond precious. I'm standing in the middle of, the, of a desert right now, but you wouldn't know it. And all of this life is here thanks to this river. This forest owes its existence to the river. Uh, the river is, is not just in its channel that we, where we've seen it earlier. It's also under my feet right now in the form of an aquifer. And that aquifer is flowing through this soil downhill through this valley, just like the river does, only a little slower. And it allows this forest to grow. It feeds these trees. The association of Goodings Willow and Fremont Cottonwood forms the rarest forest type in the United States. In other words, there are fewer acres of this kind of forest left in our nation than any other type of forest that we have. So that underscores how important it is to protect this place and to let it be and to let it keep thriving. Our next stop is the Mule Shoe Ranch Cooperative Management Area, 56,000 acres of desert grasslands mesquite bosques, rocky canyons, and lush streamside tree canopies. In this remote area, a two-hour desert drive from the middle San Pedro, you might not expect the miracle of water. Seven permanently flowing streams that carve up the landscape and create green, wet oases that lure a variety of wildlife and more than 180 species of birds and some of the last remaining native fish in Arizona. Yeah, there's a bunch of native fish in this pool right here. I think, I don't know if that's a desert sucker or a snorn sucker. Uh, I can see a couple of heli chub in here. That's a black bear. That's not a big one. Uh, that would be probably a yearling bear. Coming out of hibernation, their feet get soft. They haven't been using them, and the calluses that build up during the year before have fallen off, and so they have soft feet. And because of that, in the spring, they never miss the opportunity to step on a nice, soft piece of dirt. This upland landscape evolved with fire. Because this land remains free of roads and towns, the Nature Conservancy and its federal partners have been able to reinstate fire on a large scale. The result is good for bighorns, reduced shrubs that hide predators like mountain lions. Now, bighorn sheep from the mule shoe have a natural highway to reconnect with herds to the north. So our overall goal in prescribed fire here is to restore the natural fire regime, which will enhance the grasslands, which then will provide more water into these watersheds. It's going to benefit native fishes and eventually, ultimately, put more water into the San Pedro River. Our next stop, Aravaipa Canyon Preserve. By car, the trip from the Mule Shoe takes about 2.5 hours. As a crow flies, it would take a fraction of that time. Here we find another oasis in the desert, Aravaipa Creek. It flows year-round for 20 miles, half of it through steep 1,000-foot cliffs of Aravaipa Canyon. This stream is the lifeblood for the plants and animals that live here, from the bighorn sheep of the high cliffs to the tiny native fish in the stream. The Nature Conservancy first started acquiring land around Aravaipa um, 
you know, we, we had kind of just got into drought conditions. Um, you know, we were seeing uh, declines in the stream flow. Um, and, and as we acquired more and more land, um, we were able to, to um, get legal protections over some of the water rights. We were able to influence the watershed, you know, you know with prescribed fire, with um, grazing, different grazing strategies, and with uh, riparian restoration. And you know, now we've actually seen in the last 10 years, um, you know, with the work we've done here, we're, we're able to show a, an increase in stream flow in the last 10 years. This was a fallow farm um, that we acquired um, several years ago, and they, they really had abandoned farming um, what wasn't, um, wasn't economical. Um, so we, we acquired it, um, realized its importance in the ecosystem, um, and thought about uh, what are we gonna do with all this bare fallow farmland. And so I started experimenting with, with na growing native grass. So I started planting a few sections at a time, um, um, started with one or two acres, and uh, you know, now I've got you know, 30 or 40 acres. So we're, we're trying to demonstrate that this is economical to use this native grass hay um, as a feed for cattle. But we're also learning that um, yeah, having native grass out here is beneficial to a lot of um, wildlife, and especially um, overwintering bird species. Um, you know, um, white-crowned sparrow are really common out here during the winter, and they're totally dependent on grass seed um, um, as a food source because there are no insects around. What does the future hold for these lands and their inhabitants? The American Southwest is ground zero for climate change in North America. Warming temperatures will put pressure on these desert streams and the wildlife that live here. But the Nature Conservancy and our partners have prepared these lands well during our more than 50 years of stewardship. This large intact landscape is resilient. Plants and animals are able to move north or south to higher or lower elevations in response to climate-induced habitat changes. We call these intact lands climate-resistant neighborhoods. We call that a win for nature. Good afternoon, my name is Tana Cappell and I'm a marketing manager for the Nature Conservancy here in Arizona. I'm based in Tucson. I've been with the Conservancy for about 21 years. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank our stewardship staff who will be speaking uh, because they're de dealing with major fires in the area. So if they do have to jump off, it's probably because they have to deal with firefighters and others who are monitoring the fires. Our first speaker is a long-term staffer with the, with the Nature Conservancy in Arizona, Bob Rogers. Bob grew up in Southern Arizona and has worked for the Conservancy for about 30 years. And now he's the stewardship director for TNC in Arizona. So Bob, uh, could you fill us in on a little history of the San Pedro watershed and why this area is so important for the Nature Conservancy to work here? Well, thank you, Tana. Um, the San Pedro River has long been recognized as a biodiversity hotspot in North America. Um, the Nature Conservancy has been working here for over 50 years. Um, it has been an area of focus. Um, you know, some may remember the last Great Places campaign about 25 or 30 years ago. This was one of the 10 in, in North America. It really is a unique place. Um, as Ralph mentioned in the videos, you've got four eco-regions that come together and even overlap here. Um, the north-south orientation of the river creates a natural migratory pathway um, for animals and historically people. Evidence of human inhabitation in this watershed goes back nearly 13,000 years. There are numerous mammoth kill sites um, along the river. Um, it's a very unique place ecologically, um, which is why we've focused on it for so long. Um, 
there's over a hundred um, <clears throat> breeds of, or species of birds that live here year long. Uh, easily over 250 more of those that migrate through here every year. Um, so it is a um, you know, birding hot spot in North America, as many of our supporters know. But what people may not realize, it also has the highest density of mammal species of anywhere in North America, including things that are found nowhere else, like jaguars. Um, 14 species of fish, um, over 40 species of reptiles and amphibians. It truly is a, a unique place. Thanks, Bob. Um, you now live near the middle San Pedro River, river on property that the Conservancy purchased, uh, I believe in 2000. And what, what has the Conservancy done to improve the river flows in this section of river and the full river? Yeah, this is a key section of the river um, right here where I'm based. Um, the San Pedro Basin um, is almost like two big bathtubs um, aligned with each other. So um, there's not a lot of water from the upper, upper basin that passes to the lower basin underground. Most of that is just the, the little bits on the surface. So this is the first large holding just on the downstream side of that um, geologic formation. Um, there's a number of tributaries from the Skyland Mountains that come to the river here. Um, it brings the water to the surface. It flows through here about seven or eight miles per year. Um, historically, um, this was developed as a large farm. There's over 5,000 acre feet of groundwater pumping here a year. Um, which is depleting the, the surface flows in the river. Um, TNC purchased this property back in 2002 and uh, reduced pumping by 95%, um, percent, which has brought more water to the surface and enhanced the habitat um, through this river corridor. Great, thanks, Bob. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce you to Ron Day, who is the preserve manager at the Mule Shoe Ranch Cooperative Management Area. Uh, Ron, as the Mule Shoe Ranch manager, you're working with our federal partners, the BLM, the Forest, and the Forest Service on reestablishing fire in this ecosystem. And my question is, how does this help the land and particularly the wildlife here? Well, thank you, Tana. Uh, the wildlife that is found here has in many ways adapted to this ecosystem. Any changes or negative impacts to the ecosystem impacts wildlife habitat and ultimately impacts wildlife populations that are found here. Here, our human impacts are 150 years of intensive livestock grazing coupled with 100 years of very effective fire suppression. This has left us with an ecosystem that in many ways no longer resembles the one that has existed here for thousands of years. We're working with both the BLM and the forest to restore this landscape through the use of prescribed fire. We're in the planning stages of a big fire with the BLM, it'll be on the southern portion of the mule shoe. We're expected to treat it in 2023, and our expectation is that the burn unit itself is going to be somewhere around 25,000 acres. We're currently almost done with a big prescribed fire project that we're working with the Forest Service. It's called the Galliero Firescape. This is a Forest Service plan to treat the 137,000 acres of Forest Service land in the Galliero Mountains with prescribed fire. The goal of the firework, whether or not it's with the BLM or with the Forest Service, is to reduce heavy fuels, reestablish and benefit the grassland component, and ultimately restore our natural fire regime. Now, due to the remote and very rugged uh, landscape found in the Gallier Mountains, the forest is conducting most of their ignitions using a helicopter. This is a very, a very innovative technique, 
and actually involves very few people on the ground. Historically, prescribed fire is something that involves uh, a large number of people, depending on the size of the burn unit. Uh, they'll uh, attempt to contain the fire by burning a big black line around it, and then they ignite the center. Here, the forest is used in the topography in the form of these giant mountains, big rock structures that uh, don't burn, so they're an effective fire break. And they're igniting this with almost no people on the ground using helicopters. Now, if you're wondering how they ignite a fire out of a helicopter, they use these spheres. This is affectionately referred to as a ball or a ping pong ball. I don't know if you can see it. It's like bouncing in and out on, the, on what I can see. But there is a device in the helicopter that has a giant hopper that holds about 300 of these balls. Inside this ball is a chemical compound that's inert. And as it is falling out of the machine, it is injected with an accelerant that the result is when it hits the ground, it'll generate heat and the chemical reaction eventually will combust. You'll Great. see a line of fires right here. You can see in this slide, the helicopter in the upper right. Now, if you look at the line of fire down underneath it, you will see that it reflects the line of travel of the helicopter. Some of it smokes, some of it's fire, but they were all ignited by one of these ping pong balls falling out of this helicopter. In this particular burn in a three days period, they used over 70,000 of these spheres in this remote landscape to ignite fire in places that historically with hand crews, you would never be able to treat. The overall benefit of the Galliero Firescape as a whole, and this is that 137,000 acre piece of Forest Service land, that if you remember the map that you've seen earlier with the mule shoe shown in green in the bottom and Aravipa shown in green at the top, we're effectively connecting both of the work, the work that Mark has done up at Aravipa for the last 20 years and that Bob has done down here at Mule Shoe for 20 years. We're effectively treating one continuous block of land in excess of 200,000 acres. Now, from a wildlife standpoint, the trees and shrubs that have slowly changed the landscape impact the ability of a variety of species to utilize historic habitat, to move through the ecosystem, and in many instances, just to be able to continue to exist in the ecosystem. And desert bighorn sheep are the perfect example of this. A change in landscape, change in vegetation, increases shrub and tree cover, and increases lion predation on bighorn sheep. It also impacts sheep's ability to travel through the landscape. Now, we are working with the Game and Fish Department in attempting to identify travel routes that bighorn sheep from both ends of the mountain range uh, are trying to connect. So down here at the bottom of the map on the right, you see burn units in the different colors and the lines that you see are GPS transmitted sheep. These are sheep uh, that are currently have a GPS transmitter on them. And what we see is how they are moving through the ecosystem. Up on the north or the upper portion of this, you'll see a purple line and a green line. These are GPS transmitted sheep out of Aravipa. Now, historically, without a doubt, this was one continuous bighorn sheep population. They were from Aravipa at the north to Redfield Canyon, which is on the Mule Shoe on the south, and they inhabited the entire western face of this mountain. But through encroachment of heavy brush and trees, they no longer are able to go through here. So by identifying where they want to move, how they want to travel through the landscape, and as you can see from the colored burn units, we're able to inform the burn plan and treat those areas with prescribed fire in an effort to allow these sheep to go through the habitat to connect from one end to the other. That's the ultimate goal on this, is that we reconnect the Aravipa sheep herd with the mule shoe sheep herd. Now you can see that one red line on the left, uh, this lower kind of maroon block, we treated in 
uh, February of this year. And in March, we had a sheep go all the way to the north and actually came within two miles of the furthest southernmost movement of the sheep coming from Aravipa. So ultimately prescribed fire and being able to work uh, with our federal partners. We're hoping to reconnect our bighorn sheep herds, also improve the habitat for bighorn sheep and reduce predation. And there are all of the wildlife in this ecosystem benefits from this work. They've all evolved in an ecosystem that's much different than the one that currently exists. And what we're trying to do with prescribed fire is restore our historic ecosystem. Great, thank you, Ron. Uh, Ron, you once backpacked for 65 miles from the Mule Shoe Ranch to Aravipa Preserve. So we'd like to know what were some of the highlights of that walk and what observations did you make about this wild connected landscape? So I think the, uh, the biggest highlight and the thing that really struck me the most is from the point I walked out my front door, uh, I did not see a soul for five days and almost 60 miles. I walked into Mark's front door up there at uh, Aravipa and I didn't see a soul until I had gone into the Aravipa watershed at a place called uh, the Cliff Dwelling, which is in Turkey Creek, a tributary of Aravipa. Uh, the take home message and what you can really believe is this is just sheer wilderness. This is a, a phenomenal place. This black bear is actually, I have a trail camera right there. He's on the trail uh, that I, I walked on that trail a handful of years earlier than this picture was taken. But this is pristine wilderness and it's amazing. It's, it's 40 miles east of Tucson, but it's benefited from the fact that it wasn't high enough for a ski slope like we have on the Catalina Mountains. And there wasn't enough commercial timber to warrant going in and taking it. Uh, copper was not found in this lower reach. So all of the impacts of modern civilization have passed this piece of landscape by. And it's truly a, a phenomenal wild place. It has the entire intact suite of wildlife, whether or not it's birds, mammals, reptiles, everything that, that Bob has listed is still alive and well in this ecosystem. And that's the take home message. This is a wild place. And now I'd like to uh, introduce our preserve manager from Aravipa Preserve, who uh, just marked his 20 years as the Aravipa Preserve Manager. Um, so Mark, what can you uh, tell us, um, particularly about the creek, Aravipa Creek? Um, when you first started, the creek was showing signs of decline, and you found today that the creek is showing increasing flows. So what have you done to make this one of the healthiest fisheries in the southwest? Thanks, Dana. Yeah, Aravipa Creek um, actually is the best native fishery in Arizona. Um, this is a picture of a round-tailed chub, um, which is a candidate to be listed as threatened and endangered. And actually, of the 32 fish in Arizona, 23 are candidates to be to be listed or actually already listed as threatened and endangered. Um, in Aravipa Creek, this species is doing well, but really, um, and, and you'll see you, um, also, but um, really all over the rest of the state, um, there are problems that the, the major rivers, which should be our, our great fisheries, are overused and um, sometimes dewatered and don't really make good habitat for native species anymore. Um, by acquiring land around Aravipa Creek, we were able to, to secure water rights. When, when I first got here in 1996, um, we had just filed for um, a, a conservation uh, water right called in-stream flow, and we were having to prove um, to the state um, that there was water flowing through our property that wasn't being diverted for agriculture and um, in-stream flow gave us a, uh, a legal status to, to protect that water. Um, this is a graph uh, that, that the hydrologist did um, between 1994 and 2004 that showed kind of an alarming trend um, really um, of stream flow decline um, just um, from, from poor conditions, overuse, um, 
And, and luckily we were able to reverse that trend um, and, and through um, some of our water rights, um, um, retire um, agriculture um, and then do um, restoration on the stream. Um, we also acquired the Cobra Ranch um, in the video where you saw some native grass that, that we planted that, that helps um, water infiltrate into the soil. Um, and and so, so we not only um, protected the, the stream flow itself, but also the aquifer that, that feeds the creek and allows it to flow for about 20 miles. Um, the, the next graph um, will, will show actually um, the last 10 years um, that we've been measuring it. And, and these are two um, monitoring sites that we have that we, you know, in the face of climate change um, with, with some of the, the stewardship and acquisitions that, that we've made here, we've actually been able to reverse the trend um, and stabilize the stream flow, um, protect good habitat for native fish. And you know, really the, the endangered species that are in Arabipa Creek um, today um, are actually um, more numerous th than they, they were 20 years ago. Um, so, so we've been able to protect the habitat. And um, it's, it's always ironic when we bring students here to do our fish monitoring and we help them identify fish and they see spike base, um, which is an endangered species and has disappeared all over the Southwest as the most numerous fish in the creek. Um, and and there, it's, it's always um, hard to explain why there are so many of them in Arabic Creek. Great, thanks, Mark. Uh, you said that the native grass acts like a sponge that soaks up water to the aquifer that feeds Arabipa Creek. So what are some of the other benefits you're seeing from the native grass fields from the Cobra Ranch? Sure, native grass and the type of permaculture farming that we use um, has positive effects on the soil. Um, so so we've, we've converted the farm from an annual type of cropping um, where they plow up, up the field every year to a, to a permaculture type. Um, permaculture is a type of agriculture that mimics um, the natural system, the natural ecosystem. So we use native grass that would occur here naturally. Um, this is sacatone, um, which is a really important um, grass in Arizona that was plowed up in the floodplains um, historically because, because they were good for growing corn and, and other um, types of row crops. But sacatone is a really drought resistant grass that can get its roots down about 20 feet um, and can survive um, droughts like we're in right now. And, and, and we've been experimenting um, with sacatone and about 25 other species um, to, uh, to make native grass hay and use it in our restoration. Um, it uses about five times less water than traditional crops. Um, and then um, when we, we don't mow it um, and, and leave, it, um, leave sections of it during the winter, um, we see some huge benefits um, for, for wildlife using it um, as cover, um, nesting habitat, and then overwintering um, birds, especially sparrows, um, um, white crowned sparrows, savannah sparrow, you know, brewer sparrow, vesper sparrow, all um, use the, the, our grasslands in the winter when, when there are very few insects around, they, they depend solely on seed. Great. It's a great area, fabulous area. Now we're gonna open it up to questions from our audience. But before we take the first question from our audience, I just wanted to, since we introduced the, the concept of fires burning in Arizona, I wanted to, uh, to bring you up to speed on what's happening with the Arizona fires and whether the preserves are impacted. Uh, Mark, you wanna talk about the fire that's going on close to you? Sure, yeah, it's, it's kind of ironic that we're showing, showing pictures of prescribed fire um, while there's a 30,000 acre fire um, about three miles away from the preserve right now. But you know, really those prescribed fires are done in the spring or winter um, under controlled conditions. And uh, you know, wildfires are kind of burning in an unnatural um, climate affected drought conditions that aren't, aren't usually favorable. Um, fire is not really 
um, good or bad. Um, you know, it has it has both effects. And but uh, but yeah, definitely when there are uncontrolled wildfires going on, it, it can be disconcerting to live um, in an area like this. Yeah, Bob, did you have anything to add about the fires? Um, no, you know, other than that, this is probably the most uh, extreme fire conditions we've seen in at least 10 years. Um, 2011 was the record uh, setting wildfire year in Arizona. Um, we're on that path in 2021. Um, it's all going to be up to the weather. But yeah, uh, we have numerous fires that um, we're tracking um, today and uh, this week. Um, Mark, uh, Described the one at Arabipa. We have one up by Camp Verde near a property that we own. We've had fires near Flagstaff. Um, so it's a concern as we start the monsoon season, which typically brings, you know, a week or two of dry lightning before it brings rain. So um, we're following everything very closely. Most of the national forests in uh, Arizona are going to close tomorrow. So um, we will probably, uh, we don't have very many of our preserves open right now because of COVID, but we will follow our agency partners and, and probably close too when they close the public lands. <clears throat> All right. Um, we have a question from Jeff and Ruth Berger. Uh, due to the heat and water, are there more mosquitoes and other insects in the area? Uh, who would like to, to answer that? I can take that one, um, or at least start. Um, so the San Pedro River um, used to be almost uninhabitable. There was more water, but it was a big, slow-flowing swamp historically. So, you know, people did not settle uh, or stay year-round close to this river. Um, that has changed. You know, the, the only water that we have in the river now is moving, which uh, mosquitoes don't utilize um, too much, but it is, you know, referring to insects overall, it's one of the highest densities of species of insects of anywhere in North America. And again, that goes back to those four ecoregions um, coming together and overlapping uh, in this area. Um, it's amazingly diverse um, uh, group of insects. I think it might have more species of bees than anywhere else in North America. So. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. One thing I'd add, Jenna, is is uh, native fish are actually a natural control on mosquitoes, and and two of the species that we work with, top minnow and pupfish, are um, mosquito larvae are their main food source. Um, another species that are viper called loach minnow um, preys on black fly larvae. So um, native fish are very effective at at minimizing um, um, insects like mosquitoes. Good to know, thank you. We have another question from Tim Mather. Uh, how often are prescribed burns conducted? Once an area has been burned, how soon would it need to be burned again? Uh, Ron, do you wanna take that one? Sure. With the goal being to uh, reestablish the natural fire regime in the majority of the ecosystem here, that's going to be somewhere around eight to 10 to maybe 15 years. Um, so in the ideal world, uh, probably 10 years would be a good number if, uh, if you could return every 10 years. You know, and ultimately, when we talk about restoring the natural fire regime, uh, in the ideal world, the dry lightning that precedes the monsoons ignites this ecosystem, and then they just kind of burn slowly or, or continue burning until they're put out by uh, the monsoon rains. But the fires that were in this ecosystem hundreds of years ago are dramatically different than the ones there are today. And like we mentioned, this is an accumulation of heavy fuels uh, as a result of fire suppression, as well as a lack of the fine fuels that are necessary to start a fire by lightning. So that's the overall goal is to get it to a point where we don't have to conduct prescribed fire. We will let natural fire burn as it has for centuries. 
Great, thank you. We have another question from Robert Dietrich. Uh, in the 70s, he did a birding trip through the Chiricahua Mountains. He saw trogons, sulfur-bellied flycatcher, flammulated owl, beardless tarantulet, uh, and painted red start. And what he's asking is, are these species less common now? Bob, can you tackle that? I'd say, you know, the drought is having an effect on even the migratory birds. I wouldn't say that they were less common overall, though. Um, they, several of those preserve, uh, birds uh, occur in our preserves in the southeast uh, corner, um, you know, particularly the, the properties we own in the Huachuca Mountains and uh, at the south end of the Chiricahua Mountains, um, all those species are still there. Um, the drought is definitely having an impact on birds. You know, those of us that live along the San Pedro, the migratory corridor, have just noticed visually less birds moving through this year. It's just an effect of the extreme drought. Great, thank you. Uh, a question from Uinta Shabazz. Why do you mow native grasses and what do you use the hay for? Well, that would be for Mark. Yes, yeah, so um, harvesting native grass seed is um, pretty difficult by hand. It, it takes probably an hour or two to just get a pound of seed. Um, and one thing I found is that I can harvest it um, as hay. Um, hay making equipment is, is common and easy to come by. Um, and I can, if I wait um, for the seed to mature, I can harvest it as hay. Um, and then I can either feed it to cattle um, promoted as cattle feed um, to some of my neighboring ranchers, or I can spread it as mulch. And, and actually, um, with the, the rains that we get that are um, so sparse, it, it actually benefits the seed to plant it with mulch. So, so um, harvesting it is easier um, and when I bale it as hay um, and, and easier to use it later on when we use it for restoration. Great, thank you. Uh, a question, can we use drones instead of helicopters to lower costs when we're talking about igniting fires? Ron? Sure, they, uh, the BLM is currently using drones in different parts of the West. I don't believe they're using any in Arizona. Uh, at one point, the forest was going to be using drones to uh, drop the same balls that that I showed you on the Galileo fire escape. But there are a couple of downsides to using drones. Um, the first is when you're dropping 70,000 balls over three days, a drone holds like 30. Um, so it, you don't have the ability to be able to treat these large landscapes. Um, it, 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 it would be beneficial for sure in some areas, but Overall, to be able to treat these large landscapes, a helicopter is still the way to go. But that's a, a great question. And uh, with the state of the art in terms of drone technology, um, you can really see that at some point, you know, they'll be big enough to where they'll be effective. Great. <clears throat> uh, Susan asks, what role do local tribes play in conservation? And Bob, can you? tackle that one? Yeah, <clears throat> there are not, you know, um, much tribal lands, um, you know, of course, historic um, ancestral lands, the whole river was, but there are not a lot of tribal lands in the watershed now, but we are very fortunate. One, when you talk about that um, large unfragmented block, which includes a lot of land that's not on this river, um, a big chunk of that is uh, an Apache nation. Um, <clears throat> the tribes um, have, you know, lived here for thousands of years. Um, they still um, work with us at different times, identifying medicinal plants on our preserves. Um, we, uh, when I started the Mill Street 25 years ago or 27 years ago, we, uh, inventoried um, much of those riparian areas looking for medicinal plants that they cannot find anymore on the, on the tribal lands and uh, to allow them to collect those and 
preserve those areas, work around them with the fires if we have to. Um, but yeah, the, there's not a lot of tribal land within the, the uh, San Pedro um, River itself, but we're adjacent to some large tribal uh, lands that, you know, contribute to the unfragmented um, landscape. And we've worked with them in collaborative groups and stuff. Um, so uh, they're very important to native fish conservation. They own some uh, uh, pretty important native fisheries. So uh, we work together. Great, great. Uh, question from Christina Brooks. Are there public trails along these areas that you are speaking about? Uh, first, I'll go to Ron and then to Mark. Yeah, uh, absolutely, there are. Uh, you know, the, the Mule Shoe is a, it's a big place. It's 56,000 acres, but um, TNC has 6,000 of those acres are deeded land. And the other 50,000 are public land, whether it's the Bureau of Land Management or, or the Forest Service. Uh, and there is a trail network that's in the forest. It's uh, just the state of the federal budget that they don't get a lot of uh, maintenance in the Galieros compared to some of the higher use areas. One thing I didn't mention uh, that the Galliero wilderness is the Forest Service wilderness in the lower 48 states that has the fewest number of user days. So uh, just prioritizing federal budgets, the way things happen, uh, they don't get the trail maintenance that some of the higher impact areas do. Uh, but, but quite frankly, I'll, I'll trade a brushy trail for not seeing anybody any day of the week. Mark, can you tell us about trails near Arabaipa? Uh, yeah, um, so the Arabaipa Canyon Wilderness um, is actually um, almost in the middle of the preserve. We, we have private lands on both sides of it. So um, Aravipa Creek flows for about five miles and then it goes into the Aravipa Canyon Wilderness, um, which is managed by the Bureau of Land Management. Um, and it flows for nine miles um, through the canyon and then um, comes out on our property and flows for another mile and a half um, um, on our property. Um, but on the west side, um, our property um, is managed jointly um, as part of the wilderness area um, and, the, and the Bureau of Land Management issues 30 permits a day um, that you can reserve online um, and have to reserve in advance um, to go into the wilderness area. Um, from, from the east side, there's a little bit more access, um, but it's, it's actually harder to get to um, and um, they issue 20 permits a day to enter um, the Arabica Canyon Wilderness area from from the east side. There's actually not really a trail because it's it's kind of a narrow canyon that floods um, every couple of years um, and, and washes out the trail, but um, it's pretty easy hiking along the creek. You have to get your feet wet though. Great. Uh, Ron, uh, since we're looking at the escarpment behind you, uh, one question uh, I think our, our listeners might ask is how many bighorn sheep uh, do we have in the area we're talking about? Yeah, so in the, the combined uh, estimate for both Aravipa and the mule shoe is currently at about 125. They're surveyed by the State Game and Fish Department, uh, but right now the estimate's about 125 sheep. Great. Right. Uh, I'm not sure who is asking this question, but um, uh, our listener wants to know, are small or slow moving animals hurt when we do control burns? Ron? You know, I'm gonna say it, it just depends on conditions. Um, you, I, you couldn't be able to say that treating a landscape like this that there, there would not be some type of mortality associated with it. But I will say that as the, the climate is changing, we're burning much earlier in the year than what we used to. For example, this year when we treated the burn unit, it was in uh, early February. The first ignition day was February 8th. Um, and because of that, so if it's a, if it's a reptile, it's almost guaranteed to be in a hole somewhere or under a rock. 
Um, most animals, uh, whether or not it's a, a small mammal or a rodent, you know, depending on how they, where they're at in terms of their burrow or if they have a nest or wherever they're at, maybe they are vulnerable. Uh, but by and large, burning very early in the year as uh, climate change now dictates, I would think definitely minimizes uh, what later season burns would be. Great. One thing I'd add, Jenna, is that when we burn under a controlled situation, um, the fire burns in much more of a mosaic with a, a lot of burn patches and unburned for wildlife to escape. In. Um, another question from Martha Gifford. Um, she heard that Tucson returned treated water to the San Pedro. Is that true? And how does it affect the ability of the river to support all sorts of wildlife? I'm, I'm wondering if you mean the Santa Cruz River. Um, the city of Tucson is um, uh, returning treated water to the Santa Cruz, which is another uh, river that flows north um, into Arizona. Um, Bob, do you have anything to add to that? I, yeah, there are plans to possibly um, add tree, treated water from Sierra Vista and Fort Huachuca to the San Pedro in the future. Currently, um, we work with um, the city, Cochise County, and the fort to um, capture and um, put um, stormwater runoff um, back into key sections of the river. Um, that project will expand, um, as, especially as uh, Sierra Vista continues to expand, to include treated uh, affluent. So it will be a little bit different than what they're doing on the Santa Cruz. They, the, the water will go into the aquifer and not right into the river. Um, so that, that would be the difference. But yeah, the, currently um, the Santa Cruz has several miles of perennial flow due to treated affluent. It's pretty darn clean water and they've had a lot of success introducing native fish um, back into that river the last couple of years. Thanks, Bob. Um, Valerie asks, what cooperations do we have with private landowners and how do you work together? Uh, I'll start with Mark and then Bob. Um, well, I'm actually a member of a watershed group um, called the Aravaipa Watershed Conservation Alliance. Um, that is was formed by a group of ranchers um, in my area, um, and yeah, we we talk about a lot of different different things and and, and ways to work together. Um, yeah, in the past, um, ranchers have have viewed conservation organizations as adversarial. Um, I've been here 25 years and, and have tried to become um, a, a member of the community, um, understand um, what, what uh, my neighbors are, are working on and what their concerns are. And I think we've done a, a, a good job of um, flipping the conversation, um, um, getting them to appreciate um, the rare species that, that occur here and, and really open space cattle ranching doesn't have a, a lot of conflicts um, um, with what we're trying to do in this watershed. Bob, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, you know, both Mark and Ron up in the mountains above here work a lot with ranchers uh, cooperatively and all different kinds of projects. Um, down here on the main stem of the San Pedro Private landowners look a little bit different. The largest uh, landowners on this lower river are some of the biggest mining companies in the world. Um, but believe it or not, we do find common ground and work together on projects. Um, it's an interesting, um, ever evolving uh, relationship. Um, but, um, you know, it, it uh, <clears throat> that's what makes the conservancy unique. Um, we are pretty much the only conservation group working with them um, right now. And, uh, you know, um, most of our issues focus around water and the availability of water for the river. Um, so, um, you know, we don't 
take positions for or against the mines, but we do try to work with them to minimize impacts and especially think about um, keeping water in the San Pedro. Great, thank you. Uh, we have about five minutes left. So I'd just like to ask a final question and a, a good question, which is there's so much bird life and so much wildlife in this area. Uh, and, and, and just to reiterate, why do we find so much wildlife in this area, Bob? Well, I think, you know, when you bring four large ecoregions together um, with species specific to those regions, but they overlap here. Um, I think that's one of the reasons that it's just so biologically rich here. And then as Ralph mentioned in the ri river, when you take an arid area like this, and we have, you know, the elevational gradient in this watershed is like from 2000 feet to almost 10,000 feet. So, you know, that creates a lot of different habitat in itself. And then when you put water in the desert, you're just, you know, it's always gonna be a very special place. Thank you all for your great answers. And I just wanna let folks know that we will be sending you out uh, more information if, because we didn't get all the questions answered. And I'll turn it back over to Allison. Thank you, Tana, and thank you to Dan, Bob, Ron, and Mark as well. We really appreciate you guiding us through the Sky Island region of Arizona today and showing us just why it's so special. And thank you again for everybody in the audience for sharing your time with us. We've posted a link to a brief survey in the chat, and I hope you'll take a few minutes to provide your comments. Your feedback is helpful as we plan future events. As Tana mentioned, we'll share out more information along with the link to the recording of this event, along with a recording to all of our field trips from this series. And in the meantime, please email us. Our email is on the screen if you have any additional questions. Thanks for joining us on this field trip and for any others you were able to attend with us this spring. And thanks for your support as Legacy Club members. Have a great summer and we'll see you in the fall.